Thank you, Mayor Sappho. Good evening, everyone. And welcome to the Young Science Academy Youth Ambassador presentations tonight, a part of a program called the Youth Cause Initiative. Cause stands for Climate Action and Urban Sustainability Emissaries. We needed an E word for meaning ambassador, in case you're wondering. <laughs> My name's Rob Condon. Um, people affectionately call me Dr. Rob, and I'm the founder and executive director of a youth science nonprofit organization based just across the road here at the Harrelson Center called Young Scientist Academy. Um, before I introduce the real stars of the show tonight, I just wanted to take a, a quick moment to thank Councilman Spears for the very generous invitation tonight and for our youth to come and present some work that they've been working very hard with not only just past summer, but you know, over at least the, the last year. We really appreciate all the support provided by the City of Wilmington, particularly through the Rise Together initiative, which this work is, is based on, and for all the friends and collaborations and partners we've made with organisations in the community. And I particularly want to highlight um, Jenna Worth's dedicated team at Voyage, who we work very closely with, so thank you all. Science is a powerful tool for problem-solving issues in our community, and our youth are uniquely positioned to address these issues. But there are virtually no opportunities provided to our youth of all backgrounds to experience science, let alone have them critically think and express opinions on a particular issue that they're experiencing in a daily life, trauma even. Youth are our future leaders. I think they're standing behind me here. So when I founded YSA, it was my vision to provide a venue that builds community around science and technology with equal access and in a safer nurturing environment and a platform that facilitates the youth voice, which is really important because they are community ambassadors and you're gonna be inspired by what they say tonight. I'm really proud of their achievements and for me personally, I'm inspired by them every second of the day and they drive me to be a better person. So enjoy the presentations. Just remember, these are regular kids that have taken the initiative, they've grabbed the bull by the horn and run with it. And I'm sure you're going to be amazed at what the youth can achieve when provided the opportunity to be explorers, be creators, share ideas, and just have a pl safe place to build confidence and relationships with the community. So thank you again, and I'm going to pass it over to one of my star staff members, Michaela, to talk more about the presentations. Thank you. Hello, looking very astute this evening. Um, my name is Michaela Molina, and I have the pleasure of being the program director at Young Science Academy. Um, the youth you're about to hear about are some of my favorite lab partners, collaborators, and even teachers. Working with them has allowed me to rediscover the ingenious curiosity that led me to this field in the first place. Um, for that, I will always be grateful. YSA aims to empower youth by encouraging them to investigate our natural curiosities and use scientific approaches to solve real world problems in our communities. I thank our sponsors at Encino, Novant Health, and Landfall Foundation, and especially our partners at Voyage and El Cuerpo for the ability to proudly serve 80 to 100 young scientists each week. With 75% black and Latinx and 75% female participants, our programs include the Sidewalk Science Program, where young scientists begin to learn the art of observation through the scientific method, the Code Ninas Program, which provides young girls foundational skills in HTML and Python code, and finally, our ambassadors of the Youth Cause Initiative, who stand by me today. This summer, our ambassadors have worked diligently on research projects relating to climate change, urban sustainability, and public health. This culminated in our flagship Youth Cause Summit. And I'm honored to look to our ambassadors as the next leaders of our scientific com communication and work closely with you all, the leaders of our community. Our research is to be presented on a report on Earth Day in 2022, which greatly complements our city's Rise Together initiative. Without further ado, I'd love to allow our ambassadors to show you tonight a small sample of what we've been working on in the lab and display just what the youth are capable of when provided the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Amari. I've been in YSA for a couple of years and I'm 11. I was recruited from Maids Park, and I like these type of programs because it keeps me busy in a positive way. 
I'm going to talk to you today about one of the biggest issues worldwide, and that's climate change. In a recent report, it was shown that 85% of the world's population has already been affected by climate change. For me personally, I'm really concerned about climate change because I live in Forest Hills area and my grandma lives in Maids Park area and I know that it's already impacting our lives and I want to make a change. What is climate change? We know flooding, wildfires, pollution, and drought are all driven by climate change. These are the impacts. However, this didn't happen overnight. Climate change is a long-term change in temperature that is measured by science. As it turns out, a lot of climate change is driven by what humans do. When people burn fossil fuels, greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide get released in the air and are trapped in clouds and it makes the world hotter. This is called the greenhouse effect. This is seen in this graph where the blue line for carbon dioxide and the red line for temperature are rapidly increasing. This graph is for in the entire planet and levels haven't been measured in Wilmington, but don't worry, your young scientist has got it. The youth at YSA have been conducting weather balloon launches into near space for the past four years, and I'm looking forward to being a part of the next launch in the spring. This takes a lot of teamwork, collaboration, and creativity to be able to measure the temperatures and gases. We have taken some spectacular images. Here's a picture of Lake Waccamaw. From near space, even Luana the Legonaut gets an appearance. Using these weather balloons, we can collect really valuable information, and it doesn't cost a fortune. This small pie measures the temperature and gases in the atmosphere and how they change over time. The question still remains, what about the temperature in Wilmington? You may recall that the past summer there were lots of media reports about cities being very hot, even here in Wilmington, but what does, but what does this data show? We analyzed temperature data from the airport for the past 70 years. Basically, to sum it all up, it's getting hotter. During the fall and summer, you will see these changes more and also during the night and day. At, at night, it will mostly get hotter, and this will cause it to be hotter longer. Now you're here from Ashwin about climate change in the ocean. Uh, hi, my name is Ashwin. I'm 14 years old, and I've been with YSA since it first started in 2017. I've loved being part of this program, and especially when I presented my research at a professional conference in Providence, uh, Rhode Island. So, oceans cover 70% of Earth's surface, and it's very important for weather, recreation, and the economy, especially here in Wilmington. And any change to the oceans affects a lot of people. And the oceans are getting warmer. You've just heard about how land temperatures have been rising, but climate change affects the ocean too. And as you can see here, in recent uh, years, sea surface temperatures have been rising sharply. This can affect flooding, weather, weather patterns, the chemistry of the oceans, and ocean biology. And these are only a few effects of rising sea surface temperatures, which we know of, and there are still many yet unknown consequences. And one hot topic under investigation is that jellyfish blooms are speculated to increase in frequency as our oceans get hotter. And here's a picture of many jellyfish being caught in a fisherman's net. And many scientists believe that due to rising sea surface temperatures, jellyfish populations could rise sharply causing them to even become an overly dominant species. And jellyfish blooms are particularly important to Wilmington's economy because our economy depends heavily on tourism and fisheries, and both of them can get impacted by jellyfish blooms. Tourists might not want to come back to Wilmington if they get stung a lot on the first time, and fisheries could get impacted because a lot of fish could get killed by these jellyfish. So here's a visual of the life cycle of a jellyfish. As you can see, jellyfish first start out 
as these tiny polyps. They, they then produce um, baby jellyfish, which eventually turn into medusa, which is what comes to mind when we think about jellyfish. So at YSA, we performed an experiment to test how climate change would affect jellyfish life cycles. And so we incubated jellyfish polyps at many different temperatures to simulate changing ocean temperatures. And we collected data for 60 days, and we collected data on how many polyps are produced and how many baby jellyfish they produced. And as you can see here, the sample is incubated in higher temperatures, as shown by the blue lines, um, formed more polyps than those in cold temperatures. And this data seemed to support what many people believe about rising ocean temperatures causing more jellyfish. However, as you can see in these graphs, baby jellyfish were only produced from the polyps in colder water, and almost no baby jellyfish were produced in warmer water. And this means that with oceans warming, jellyfish won't be able to go through their full life cycle all the time. So overall, what this means is that rising ocean temperatures would cause a decline in jellyfish populations, contrary to what many people believe. And this research shows that shows the importance of following the scientific method and collecting and analyzing data before drawing any conclusions. And this is only one of the many issues that YSA has researched, and there are many other ongoing projects at YSA. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, hi, uh, good afternoon. I'm Naomi. I'm 11 years old. Uh, I spend a lot of my time on green space and parks with the nature connecting with my family and my community. I run cross country and I spend a lot of time running through trails. Access to, this, to these spaces is very important to me. At Wilmington Grills, we are witnessing more and more of these green spaces being converted into, con into concrete and industrial buildings. Over the summer, my colleagues and I decided to determine how much green space is in Wilmington. We took images of Wilmington and using Python coding, determined how much of the space was concrete. See here that white pixels represent concrete. The image is, this image is one of the many one kilometer squared quadrants we took of Wilmington. We used all these blocks to generate a green space map. We used our data and Python coding to make a map and each dot is one image analyzed. On this map, there are three main areas of note. Downtown, where we find ourselves today, the industrial corridor running along College Road, and the edges of green space that are quickly being replaced by housing and industrial relation. To understand more about concrete effect, we used a thermal camera to compare different substrates that cover our city. At each of these sites, we found that grass is consistently colder than concrete. You may have felt just how well concrete conducts heat if you've ever walked on the sidewalk barefoot. We found that concrete is hotter than grass by 9 to 27 degrees Fahrenheit. So, similar to the green space map, we used our, da our data to create a heat map. If you recall, the two, two biggest areas of concrete that we see in the map are the hottest areas in the city. The edges of green space are also seen here with the cooler temperatures. Wilmington is a growing city, but there's an untapped real estate here, rooftops. Rooftops can be home to solar panels. They work like penguins, turning their backs to the sun for warmth. They attract UV rays and turn them into sustainable energy. Hi, I'm Lucy. Hi, I'm Lucy Moore, and I'm a 12-year-old youth ambassador. Now, if you cast your mind back about three weeks, you may remember when we had that stretch of severe rain. This is an issue because Wilmington is getting wetter. Rainfall has increased quite a bit over the past 50 years, especially in the fall. And because of that, it's helped by the increase of concrete. Nuisance flooding has increased as well. 
And that's what I'm going to talk about today, nuisance flooding. So the first question you may be wondering about is why is urban flooding important to pay attention to? The answer is right here. Urban flooding washes oil into the ocean, polluting our planet. It erodes roads, destroying our infrastructure. And perhaps most troublesome of all, it can, cars can slip in big puddles. For example, I took this picture I saw sliding off the road and crashing. Concrete doesn't absorb water, so it, it just, the rainwater just sits there until it evaporates, creating nuisance flooding. And as you can see in a picture on the previous slide, bricks weren't that much better at drainage. So here's my hypothesis. Concrete equals flooding. Rain equals flooding. Bad storm drain systems equals flooding. Concrete plus rain plus bad storm drain systems equals an unhealthy amount of flooding. So here's what I did. I took pictures of puddles. I took notes on puddles. And I did lots of lots of driving around looking for more puddles. Here are some pictures of urban flooding in downtown Wilmington, such as Red Cross and Fifth. When you look, you see that most urban flooding is located in areas that are lighter, which means more concrete. Here's an animation to show why. So when it rains on a green space area, it just soaks into the ground. But if green space is eradicated, replaced by concrete, when it rains, the water just wants to slide off the concrete. But because of rising tides, the water just sits there on top of the concrete, creating nuisance flooding. So here's what I think we should do in the future. I think we should replace concrete with semi-permeable substances, such as certain types of cement and bricks. I think we sh should build better storm drain systems and increase the amount of green space in our community. Of course, urban flooding isn't the only type of flooding we need to worry about. There's also tidal flooding, which I mentioned in the animation. If temperature rises two degrees, the sea level will rise drastically about six feet above its current level. Because of that, you won't need to go to the beach anymore. The beach will come to you. Hi, my name is Mikayla. I'm 13, and I want to be a detective, scientist, or an actress. Not sure yet. Thank you again for this opportunity. We hope you have enjoyed the presentations today. Of course, these are just a few of many topics we have been working on. In addition, we, we examine impacts of COVID, hurricanes, tidal flooding, mold as a public health hazard, food deserts, healthy eating, pollution, and many more. We have worked really hard on these projects, and we really want these issues to change. We encourage everyone to one, listen to our ideas, two, read our report next to Earth Day, and three, invite us back into the future to talk about other issues. For me personally, this experience has meant a lot. I liked having fun while learning science and how the real world, wor real world works. I also loved our field experiences from Bald Head Island to visiting NC State and the NC Art Museum to just hanging out with my friends. We would love to answer any questions, but first, a final short summary video of our summer adventures. <laughs> Thank you.